So the first thing that we're going to go over is whether or not to bluff. Because I, I don't think that this, I mean, I pulled an example from past play. But this is not really as intricate as I would say when you really want to think about whether or not you actually need to pull back on value based upon image. Although this is a more common situation, but I think that you guys are going to be able to derive what I'm talking about here based upon just basically one, you know, example. So we'll go over the hand and then we'll talk about how it might differ with a good or a bad image in, in a given scenario. So all these hands that I'm actually going to discuss are assuming in a 2-5 game with 800 effective, so just over 150, you know, big blinds, pretty, pretty common type of scenario. If you play lower stakes, you can obviously cut the stacks down, but right around, you know, 160 blinds, something like that. So this particular example, we're in MP1 with Jack 10 of diamonds. So hero opens to 20 after it gets folded to him with Jack 10 of diamonds from MP1, the button in the big blind call. So you've got a guy in position that calls and the big blind calls and the pot is 60 bucks. The board comes out, nine of diamonds, deuce of clubs, three of spades. So this is just like a textbook, dynamic, multiple barrel type of situation, right? Multiple barrel type of scenario. We've got great properties in our hand here too. CBAT bluffing matrix, there's only really two guys in the hand. This is so good with the properties in, in our hand, I would probably even bet into like three people here, which is kind of a rarity. Once you start to get like four or more, I think it's mostly burning money, but there are some outlier extreme scenarios where it still might be profitable, and this might be one of them. Three to a straight flush, two over cards. The chances of top pair changing by the river is very high. Obviously, sometimes it might come out low, low, but usually a nine is not gonna remain top pair. And the great thing about mid to low stakes is usually someone's going to, you know, raise off with like a set by the time we get to the river. So big blind checks to us and we start a bet of 35. Now the button calls and the big blind folds. So the pot here is $130. So we do get through one person here. Now remember next act calls, which is usually going to indicate strength because button should pretty much only have nine X here. I mean, I, I guess it's possible like they could call with like five sixes even next to act, but the but the big blind would have been wider if the button hadn't called. One quick thing, guys, we're running a special promotion for this video only. If you use the coupon code LEARN and you are a new member, you get the first two months for free over at Crush Live Poker. And this is an example of what we do over at the website. The other thing that's interesting to note here too, as the pot is $130, is that we can say, well, it's good that we got through one person. And it is good that we got through one person, but actually sometimes if it goes call, call, you can really leverage the player who's next to act here. Let's think of an example here where the button called and the big blind called. And then, you know, the turn is a queen, like I'm gonna give you here, and we bet again. It's very, very difficult for the button to now call with the nine because he still has to worry about the guy behind him. Whereas here, now that we're heads up against the button, he still might continue to piece off on a queen turn on nine deuce three with a nine. He still might continue on here. He doesn't have to worry about anybody behind him. So in this particular example, it is just one person that calls 35 on nine deuce three rainbow, nine of diamonds. We've got, we've got jack 10 of diamonds. Button calls, big blind folds, pot's 130 bucks. The turn now is a queen and it's the queen of spades. And I have intentionally included this so that there's a backdoor spade draw because when you're trying to figure out whether or not you're gonna bluff, if a backdoor draw appears on the turn on a rainbow flop, there's always the possibility that somebody might be sticking around on the turn because they've picked up the backdoor flush draw, whereas meaning that their hand isn't actually all that strong, if they hadn't picked up the backdoor flush draw, they would be out. But now that they picked up the backdoor flush draw, they're still in. Obviously, that is not a variable or not a thing to consider if it's a rainbow flop and the turn is the fourth suit. There is no backdoor flush draw. But here, specifically on nine of diamonds, deuce of clubs, three of spades, and the turn's the queen of spades, obviously the guy can have nine X of spades. He can have straight draws like four five of spades if he's really wide four you know four six of spades something that would have been a straight draw on the flop although this board is isn't as treacherous as other ones but straight draws that pick up the backdoor flush draws so you always want to look at the distribution of the suits and stuff like that on the flop so in this particular example here 
the turns of the Queen of Spades, bringing a backdoor flush draw. The other thing to note about this is that if the backdoor flush draw appears, there are river scenarios where you will want to continue to bluff at it because the guy's calling range on the turn doesn't necessarily have to be all that strong because they may have picked up the backdoor flush draw. Whereas if there was no backdoor flush draw, that would be in general where you'd want to pull it back on the river because he's calling the turn with something. So turn is the queen of spades. So that's obviously a great barrel card for us, right? I mean, we started this on this dynamic board with this properties over hands with jack 10 of diamonds. Now we're open-ended on the turn. So the pot's 130. Again, we're up front. Nine, deuce, three. Rainbow turns the queen of spades. We have jack 10 of diamonds. So now we've got 100. 100 into 130. I will also note that we could really use a large sizing here. Anytime top pair changes and it does not connect with any form of sort of straightening cards here, which it doesn't, and any type of really two pair. I mean, I guess obviously the guy could have queen nine suited, but that's basically it. You can bet a lot larger. Now, why is it that you can bet a lot larger and why is this somewhat of a short circuit in live poker? The theory goes as to why you can bet larger is because players are actually supposed to defend down lighter, meaning that you can do it with value. And if you're trying to stay sort of in a balanced way, you get more value from your good hands. They're supposed to defend down lighter. That's why if you see a given scenario where someone is allowed to bet large, that comes from the fact that their opponents have to defend wide. So you get max value. That sometimes is not what the dynamic is actually in live poker because a lot of non-studying players don't necessarily agree with this. So 100 into 130 is pretty large. It's not an overbet sizing. So now the guy calls again. So the pot's 330. And now the river rolls off really a great barrel card for us, the ace of clubs. Now, sometimes the king can actually be a better barrel card in a given scenario, like on a nine deuce three rainbow board, because a king just has absolutely no connection. Here on an ace, if someone was sticking around with like a wheel draw, like ace four, ace five, they've rivered an ace. Obviously here, if a king came, you know, it would make our hand, but this is still a really good barrel card. There was no flush draw on the flop. Obviously like four or five comes in, but again, in order for him to really stick around, it's really only one combo of four or five that he could really have, which is like four or five of spades. So it's a great barrel card here at the end. Now I would say, so we are left with nothing, Jack 10. We've, we're left with absolutely nothing. So nine, deuce, three, queen, ace, you know, barrel, barrel, barrel. And now the question is, do we go for it or not, right? Do we go for it or not? What I find interesting about this particular run out here is obviously the strength of your opponent, whether or not he understands how the texture of the board sort of interacts with your hand. Also, if you go ahead and bet here, what are you betting? Now, hopefully you are good enough to possibly, you know, bet a hand like ace queen running into ace king, or even sometimes like I would certainly, if I was barreling with ace five, ace four is the preflop razor and I ran into it at the end, there's no reason for me not to bet here. If the guy called nine deuce three, I bet he called, turns a queen, I bet he called, he doesn't believe me, Rivers and ace, I might make a very modest block bet with like, especially with like ace four where I block four or five, things like that. But there are definitely people that might not bet at all. Now, if you had kings here, is that maybe a little bit too thin of a bet? It's possible. It's possible. Now, I wasn't even going to talk about pulling back on value, but I'll, I'll, I'll add that in here in a second. This is a situation where it's probably a very good spot to run a triple barrel. So if you had a neutral or a good image, and let's say that this was like a mix of 80% of the time we bluff, 20% of the time we check, how do we randomize that? I would just look at it like in the session right now, starting from a neutral image on a scale of one to 100, and I'm like a 50, let's say at the beginning of the session, I'm a 50. Am I in the top 80% of where an image could be? Meaning like if I were to rate my image right now, is it at least a 20 out of 100? If it was at least a 20 out of 100, I would bluff here if we want to bluff 80% of the time, because this is a really, really good spot to bluff. Are there certain situations where I might not bluff? Yes, there are. And it would be the situations where my image was so bad, or at least it was in the bottom 20% of all sessions, that a guy's still going to call me down with a nine here or flat or call me down with tens or something like that. But I think that you can start to see, though, you're not making as much money if we were in this particular situation in live poker. If we were in a situation where it was an 80-20 bluff, we're not making as much money by just entirely randomizing it, like picking a number 
one to 10, if we pick out of a hat and we pick numbers one and two, we don't bluff, but everything above two, we do bluff. That strategy is entirely random. That will not make as much money as what I am advocating, which is trying to score your image. Because if you have a good image, the bluff's going to get through more, more often. That is the example of bluffing. This one wasn't necessarily 50-50. It's like a really, really good spot. But if you were in a situation where it was dead 50-50, do you have an image that's in the top 50%? How about a situation where you're giving up most of the time? You're giving up 80% of the time. And you're only bluffing 20% of the time. Well, that would dictate that you have to have a really, really good image to pull the bluff. An image like you are having, say, like a top 20% type of image in this particular session. Obviously, we're not scoring image. We don't, there isn't any right answer to this. But again, I, I have to reiterate, though, this is a better way of doing it that will win more money in the reality of live poker than just entirely randomizing a split off. Now, this is an interesting one that isn't as common. You don't get into this situation, I would say necessarily as commonly when we think about it, even though we were making a lot of value bets. How thin should we go for value in a given situation? Counterintuitively, the better and the more godlike your image is, I truly believe that the adjustment that you should make to your good image is actually making less thin value bets. Like I talked about in the top of the show. Why is that? It's because you're not getting called down as much. So if you're not getting called down as much, you are not getting called down by the weaker portions of your opponent's range that you want to get called down with, with a really, really good image. So again, two, five, 800 effective. Hero raises, ace of hearts, ace of spades, the 20 from plus one, the button and the big blind call. So the pot's 60 bucks. And the flop comes out, jack of diamonds, deuce of diamonds, eight of hearts. So big blind checks and hero bets 40. So about two thirds the size of the pot. Usually in a typical live game, people are playing wider than they should. Gonna be a lot of offsuit broadways in there. Obviously we've got a front door diamond draw, some straight draws, things like that. So I don't really mind the larger sizing, button folds, and now the big blind calls. So the pot's $140. Now, what are we concerned about with aces? You know, there's a possibility of front door diamonds, 9, 10. And especially if the big blind is calling here, you can be wider than the button, doesn't have to worry about the button. So probably isn't folding out probably much of any pair or any gut shots. So these interior straightening cards that can come like a seven, a nine, obviously like a queen, a 10, those could also bring in some two pair types of holdings that the big blind might have as well. So that's what I would be thinking about if I had aces, but the turn brings the three of clubs. So that's a huge, huge brick. So the pot's 140 and it gets checked to the hero who bets 110 now. Again, probably could size up a little bit, but goes 110. And once again, the big blind calls. So now the pot is 360. Now, in terms of the sort of made hand portions of the big blinds range, it's gonna be skewed towards like jack X. Now, maybe an eight will continue to stay in there too because it's a three on the turn. So let's keep that in mind. And now we get an interesting river. It's the queen of diamonds. So it brings in the front door diamond draw and it also completes nine ten. And again, the big blind checks. Now, I'm not saying that the big blind is necessarily always going to lead out when they make a flush, but you will see that commonly because people in the hero's position are going to check back so many one pair types of hands. People don't want to necessarily lose value. If the guy is also nitty, he might not just bet 9-10. He might be sort of coming into like a check call shell because the front door diamonds you know, came in. So when we take a look at this, I think it's probably a pretty close spot, especially when we don't have the diamond in our hand. I mean, if we had aces with the ace of diamonds, it would be probably uh, a much easier bet. So for those reasons, also queen jack, you know, makes like a two pair type of holding. I would say that it's fairly thin to bet again here for value when all the draws come in, if you think your opponent is just going to fold out a jack here at the end. So this is, again, probably one of these spots that would be somewhat mixed, like kind of a mixed spot, but it goes the opposite way of what I just talked about before, 
because we are getting so many folds with a good image, with a godlike image coming out of like a super session, you know, where we're winning big and we've got a lot of chips in front of us, we might not get a call here from a jack. People have looked at us and we're winning huge and we always have it when we show it down. So they might be folding out more of that sort of weaker portion of a range, you know, a, a hand range in this particular spot. You know, queen 10 is another hand that the guy could possibly have. I don't think queen 10 is folding. But with a bad image, especially if we were losing inside of this particular single session, we're going to get called a lot more. So if this was a spot where just to keep it even, I'm not necessarily saying that it is 50-50, but let's say that it's a mix of 50-50, where value betting 50% of the time, we're checking back 50% of the time, instead of just flipping a coin or using some sort of technique to randomize, we're going to lean on what our image is. If our image is super good and we're winning a lot of non-shown down pots, people are staying away from us, this is a really, really good example of where we actually might pull it back and check behind. Conversely, if our image is total shit and people don't believe us, they think maybe we're tilting, we're trying to push the action, we would be more likely to get called here by a jack if the guy had like king jack, jack 10, something like this. Do you see how this sort of plays out if they think that you're trying to chase some losses? Oh, you're going to use this queen as a bluff. Who's betting here? Only people with a flush, that type of thing. You very well might get called by jack x, but if you're just running over the table and having an absolute godlike session, my contention is that people are staying away from you. So when you bet and get called, that's going to be a much stronger portion of your opponent's range which would lead us to actually making less of a thin value bet at the end. Now, like I said, I think that this comes up a little bit less frequently than when you are having a great session and you can sort of bluff. I think bluffing in terms of this image concept is maybe like 70% and pulling back on value might be 30% of kind of what we're trying to approach. But I think that was a pretty good example to sort of start off what I'm talking about here. I have another example here too, in a given type of uh, scenario where dealing with a front door flush draw. So let's take a look at this one too. Same thing, two, five, 800 effective. This time we get a limp from up front from plus one and we are in the cutoff with black aces and we raise it up to 25 over the top of a limp. Maybe we open it up to four X with no limpers. So with one limp, we raise it up and we add a big blind. So we make it 25, folds all the way back around to the limper who calls. So the pot's like 55, depending on the drop or the rake, pretty good spot to be in. I love having a big hand with a limper from up front in live games like this. Board comes out, king of hearts, three of hearts, seven of spades. So there's a front door heart draw out there. Guy from up front checks, and we bet 30 into a pot of about 55, and he makes the call. So now the pot is about $115, and obviously the limper could have a front door heart draw, most of his range is probably consisting of king x. People love to sort of limp in with high offsuit broadways from up front, like king queen, king jack. Once in a while, he might have like a gut shot or a hand like seven six, eight seven, something like that. But we like this spot. The turn is the six of clubs. So king three seven, front door hearts. Turn now is the six of clubs. He checks to us. And this time we bet 85 into 115. This is probably a pretty good spot where you can bet. And if you get raised, you can evaluate the situation if you get check raised. But they're just going to continue to call down here a lot with King X and front door hearts. And in this example, that's what the limper does. He check calls the 85. So now at this particular point, the pot now is $275. And the river rolls off the four of hearts. So king of hearts, three of hearts, seven of spades. Turn is the six of clubs and the river is a four of hearts and it puts a one liner out here to a five and the guy checks here again. So this is another one of these spots where it's probably pretty close. Sometimes guys will have two pair and they're checking. Sometimes they might 
have a five, although in this particular case, a lot of times, most of the fives would consist of front or hard draw, so you would make a flush here at the end, but you know, you might have had some sort of pair that backed into some sort of straight and is checking it because of the front door heart. Now with a very good image here, if you didn't think that you were gonna get called by king, queen, king, jack because people were staying away from you, this is a great example of where you might actually pull it back and not value bet here. Now, I love to value that bet these spots, especially when I unblock top pair. I think a better example might have been like if the hearts just totally bricked out and it wasn't a heart at the end, I would be value betting aces all day with a good or a bad image, by the way, because you're always going to get called down by king x. But even here, it's still close because if our opponent did make a flush, there has to be some frequency. And I think more than 50% that he's going to lead out at the end because he wants to get value from a lot of one pair of hands or anything that will just check back on the river. So his range still has a lot of king x in it. And if you were to have a bad image, you absolutely would want to bet here because King X is going to call. They think you're pushing it. They think that you're bluffing and they haven't seen you really win. So they're going to call you down. Maybe they think you're tilting a little bit. But if you have a godlike image, if you're just absolutely running over the table, you've got a lot of chips in front of you, they very well might actually fold King X thinking, oh, this guy got lucky again. He hit a heart at the end. So the, really the moral of the story here in this particular hand, like the examples that I've given is, is that this is a mix. Sometimes check back, sometimes bet. But instead of trying to entirely randomize using whatever methods that you wanna use, you wanna use your image to actually randomize. So again, if this is a 50-50 spot, 50% check back, 50% bet, then I would wanna have my image sort of in the bottom half of my session in order to bet. And if my image is sort of in the top 50% at that particular time, then maybe I would say check this one back as well. So I think that that kind of wraps up like the whole thing in a bow. If you have a really good image, obviously you can bluff more. And if you have a bad image, you should pull it back. And when you're going for thin value, if you actually have a really good image, you should probably pull back the thin value bets a little bit. But if you have a really bad image, you can actually go much, much thinner and try to think about where your image sort of falls into the session, sort of rate your image. Hey, like, am I, do I have like only a 20 out of a hundred type of image here in a given scenario? If that's the case, then in, you know, look for a situation where you think it might be a, a mix of, Hey, like I'm only gonna uh, value bet once in a while, but because my image is so bad, this might be the time to do it. Or if I have a really good image, I might only bluff once in a while, but because my image is so good, I might do it in this particular case. Remember, people have short memories and they are paying attention, whether it's intentional or not, to who is winning or losing at the table when it's happening right in front of them.